you. Coming at you. Bounce down, disaster. Coming at you. Bad, 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 Hello and welcome to In Focus. I'm Rom Gaioso, your host. Tourism is one of the pillars of international trade. As we go elsewhere, resources change hands, both domestically and abroad. We know where tourism has been during the time the world came at a standstill. But where is it going? In today's show, we're welcoming two very distinguished members of the World Future Studies Federation, WFSF, to discuss the future of tourism. Folks, the future is arriving a lot faster than what we think, so let's get going. So before I start, I would like to say a few words about this show. So this show is a result of a partnership between WFSF and yours truly, Futures Television. We're joining forces to advance sharing of information and knowledge of futures topics. Our focus is on future studies, foresight, and futures literacy. What should you expect? Well you will gain direct access to knowledge and information produced by the top minds in this field. WFSF is a UNESCO and UN consultative partner and a truly global NGO with members in over 60 countries. Today, we have two top researchers who will be discussing a very current topic. What should you expect to gain from this show? Well, today we meet two researchers who have invested their careers to help us make sense of of industry trends, and with their help, we will see firsthand the work they perform at NHL Standing University, learn all about the European Tourism Futures Institute, and we'll hear about the Journal of Tourism Futures. All of that and much, much more. So folks, uh, before I welcome our guests, don't be shy. The chat windows are open, so feel free to say hi. All righty, let me uh, start with a little bit of a profile. So I would like to introduce our guests today. Dr. Ian Yeoman is a professor of disruption, innovation, and new phenomena at NHL Standing University of Applied Sciences. He is the champion of tourism futures. And based upon his initial work as scenario planner at Visit Scotland, where he introduced scenario construction, economic modeling, and trends analysis within the organization in order to understand and make sense of the external environment. He then moved to New Zealand, where he was involved in a number of tourism futures projects for government agencies and national strategies, while an associate professor at Victoria University of Wellington. He is the co-editor of the Journal of Tourism Futures, author of over 70 research papers and 22 books. He is presently writing and editing a number of books including 2075, The Future of Food Tourism, Scenario Planning and Tourism Futures, and Scenarios for Global Tourism, expected for publication in 2024. So let me say a few words about Professor Albert Fossman. He is professor in strategic foresight and scenario planning, and an expert in residents' perspectives towards tourism. He provides courses in strategic foresight and scenario planning to the industry and at different universities. Dr. Postman has applied his expertise in many national and international projects for the tourism industry and shares his knowledge regularly in guest performances at conferences and symposiums. He obtained his PhD in spatial sciences at the University of Groningen in the field of tourism community relations. All right, so without uh, further ado, let me welcome our guests to the show. How are you doing today? Hello, everyone. Kia ora. Kia ora. How wonderful to have you. I hope I didn't uh, miss anything. You know, you guys have such a wonderful career and an expert in this field. So if I miss anything, please say a few words about yourself. I think you no, did a great I'm, job. Uh, you did a brilliant job. <laughs> Nothing to add. Okay, so uh, let's get started. And uh, I really wanted to get started uh, from the beginning. So the, the real question, so why? Why is the future of tourism important? I think the future of tourism is very important. One, it's probably the world's largest global industry because it's an inter 
an industry of about the movement of people across borders. It's an industry of an enjoyment. And since the 1950s, when the first recorded statistics were collected by the UN, we had 25 million people took an international holiday, whereas today it's around about a billion. And we've seen <laughs> linear growth since the 1950s. But in the last, but but with COVID-19, it, it basically, it fell off the map. We saw a 70 to 80% drop in international arrivals. And during that time period, people wondered, what is the future of tourism? How do we make sense of it? What is beyond COVID-19? So, so the future of tourism is extremely important. There's all of these variables like consumer behavior, disposable income, climate change, sustainability, artificial intelligence, mobility, the future of aircraft, which are all of the drivers of change. But I think it's really important from a futures perspective, when you combine them, what do they mean in the terms of the future? And the role of the work that we're involved in is to try and guide that future in the terms of the construction of scenarios, trends analysis, and give industry, if it's the biggest in the world, some sort of um, making sense model of how it could unfold and what will happen. Because you can't look at the future of tourism just in a vacuum. You can't just think of it in the terms of linear growth. It's There's so much impact and change going on. It's how you make sense of it. Well, uh, we have uh, several colleagues uh, saying uh, hello to you all. Uh, so we have uh, Irving Losgut, uh, evening. Uh, and uh, we have uh, Cornelia Darham here as well. Uh, she's, she's saying hello and thank you. Uh, she's actually a very special uh, person to me. Back in 2010, she was part of my dissertation. Uh, she helped me with my Delphi panels on scenario planning. So Cornelia, how wonderful to virtually see you uh, with us today. Uh, so lots of others uh, and our colleagues from WFSF saying hello and good evening to you all. Uh, so I wanted to uh, continue our conversation and I want to rewind a little bit. So during the pandemic, there was no tourism. There was no present and no future for the industry. How did you imagine a future for something that had no present? Uh, well, there's, two, there's, there's a number of things that were going on. There was some tourism going on. So, for example, at that time, I, I was in New Zealand, and New Zealand was locked out to the rest of the world. So the only tourists were the domestic tourists. There was nobody coming from China or from the United States or South Korea. But we, ha all, we had all of these Kiwis saying, we, we can't go abroad as well, so what do we do? And I think oh, there was a big sense of, how do we help the industry? How do we make sense of the industry? And how do we understand the consumer and what they're thinking in, in, in this ch changing world? So some of the things we, we were involved in, we asked the question, how can we reimagine the future of tourism in, in, in New Zealand? And one of the projects we did was a, a, set, a set of scenarios in, in cooperation with, with Hefty. So there was no tourism, but People wanted, went on holiday still, but also destinations leaders wanted to know what the future is because to, to many COVID-19 was a dystopian future. And from dystopia, you, it leads to utopia. From an evil world or a world of despair, you want hope. So the big things at the time were, what is the future? And people were looking for hope. And that big hope was around sustainability and a regenerative future for the tourism industries in, in New Zealand. So tourism was going on. And also at the same time, we were looking to what would tourism look like post COVID-19. And we helped, we helped by making sense of a future world. Indeed. Um, so I wanted to uh, continue along the same lines of, you know, well, we know Dr. Gilman, the pandemic was not the only source of uncertainty for the tourism industry, right? There is also currently a war raging in continental Europe. So many variables, you know, all together. So mm -hmm. how do you think about the future of tourism? Well, uh, again, it's taking those variables because so you, you've got war in Ukraine, you've got artificial intelligence, you've got inflation, and you're asking the question, you've got a series of scenarios out there. You're asking what is the impact of some of these external events on that scenario? And 
by painting a multiple futures perspective, we can determine what a more appropriate pathway is. And this is this goes back to the concept of, of future proofing, trying to construct an industry or shape an industry or guide an industry down a certain pathway depending on how these external events of what they're doing immediately but also do some of these trends like inflation or, or war what happens if they're more than short term what happens if they go on for two or three years how does that change the scenario you're in in the terms of behavior and one of the, the examples then is do we move from the present state or this scenario state to another scenario state and what's the pathway in between so again the scenarios that we've been involved in are, are guides are or a sense making process to the people we work with and so it seems that yeah, you both favor scenario planning as a methodology to think about the future why is that um well, it's quite simple. Scenario planning is a methodology which says there's not one future, but a range of futures. And it's a way to tell a story. And it's a methodology that stakeholders and, and, and organizations can use and help them frame. They can see the pathway. They can see the rationale. They can see all of the uncertainties. Uh, and, and they're easy to follow because a good set a good scenario set is something which you can visualize you can see it you can imagine it um and it also during COVID 19 it had a strong sense of reality of where we're going and it's also a methodology which is good if this is the future of the world in the terms of that future state you can respond with with policy or strategy and that's very important in government circles about what are the decisions we need to take in order to manage the future well, I, I couldn't help, but I have to ask you about your background. Could you say a few words about that background? Uh, yeah, from my personal perspective, you know, I became involved in tourism futures way back in 2002. Um, I was appointed as scenario planner, the first scenario planner in tourism to visit Scotland, which is the National Tourist Board of, of Scotland. And they just appointed a chief executive, Philip Riddle, and Philip came from Shell. And Shell was a language in the terms of strategy and understanding the environment of scenario planning and responding to oil crisis. And Philip said, this is what's happening in tourism. The external environment is shaping tourism. How do we make sense of, how do we make sense of the external environment in order to find a pathway beyond? Because in 2001, 2002, it was 9-11, but it was also in Scotland, it was foot and mouth disease. And people thought that that's the end. The Scottish rural, Scottish rural locations were going to close. You know, we had American tourists phoning up. Is Scotland closed? Do we need to or do we need to bring our own food? Can we visit the farm? And that type of thing. Then moving around that 2002, it was the world's first. It was the first Gulf War. And again, American tourists are very sensitive. What is going to be the impact? of the Gulf War on Scottish tourism, there was a sense within the organization, what's going to happen? And by using scenarios, we made sense of that war in the terms of different different outputs, different stories. And it became a guide both for Visit Scotland, but also for the tourism industry and the Scottish government in the terms of, of a pathway forward. You were able to make very micro decisions about switching markets and um, advertising campaigns but also having strategic responses in the terms of changing policies more for the medium to long term. And the first scenario project I was involved in was that one, the, the Gulf War in 2002, 2003, where, where we, it was where we used the scenarios to make sense of the environment and everybody could respond to it because we could see it unfolding. And the purpose of the scenarios was to, there was an end point. It was going beyond, this is what's happening now, but look where it will be in the, ne in the next 18 months or the next three years and the change. So we were able to respond to that. And it was a good set, sense-making process for Visit Scotland and established me as the scenario planner 
in the organization, somebody that wasn't on the fringes, but it brought me right into the center of organizational decision making. That's wonderful. Uh, we're going to go back to scenario planning in just a little bit, but I wanted to, uh, to change subjects. So, uh, Dr. Poshma, uh, please introduce the European Tourism Futures Institute, the ETFI, to us. So, what is your mission, and could you talk a little bit about the work you do there? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh... As, as you already mentioned in your introduction, we are part of NHL Standing University and at our Academy of Leisure and Tourism, uh, we have always seen research as an integral part of our study programs. And this also means that we have done a lot of uh, studies for the industry, but uh, we, always looking, we were always looking back. So what we did, we, we often made trend reports uh, by the end of the year, the turn of the year, to look back about uh, tourism demand and tourism supply in certain regions in the Netherlands. However, in the 2000s, we had this, uh, these disruptions of, of uh, few were already mentioned by uh, Professor Yeoman. But there's also the Mexican swine flu, the financial crisis, for example, and that made the industry uh, ask us to establish an institute that would help the industry with looking forward instead of looking back. So that was basically the, the, the initiation of, of a call uh, to establish this institute, a top institute in, in tourism futures, which uh, basically started its operations in October 2010. The first years have been subsidized, but since 2014, uh, we are basically uh, paid by the industry to do uh, big and smaller projects. The way we are organized is basically that because we're part of a university, a professional university, so a University of Applied Sciences, that we have two kinds of programs. One is uh, knowledge development. So that's an academic kind of research program in which we have a research group with a, with a number of researchers. But we also have a, the more commercial part of our institute is, is, is doing commissioned work for the industry. Uh, and that means that those two types of research uh, are, combi are combined in order to, to learn from each other. So teachers learning to, to, to uh, in, 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 uh, who are developing knowledge about scenario planning and strategic foresight are applying that in practice and they take that with them back into education. And that's how the cycle uh, works in our institution. Yeah, it's it's uh, very interesting, and of course, uh, you do a lot of work in in scenario planning. But you know, all of the the tourism pro you know projects, and I think it's it's interesting. And because, of course, in the audience, we're not just WFSF members, but I wanted to to highlight here, folks, is pay attention. You know, peer reviewed papers. You know, this is research, and you know why we have you know two of the top world specialists in in tourism here, and, and I'm so happy. Uh, that you guys could take take the time to explain, but there are many different ways to engage the ETFI. Of course, you can you know, uh, work with both professors here, plus the entire team uh, with tailor-made research. And uh, I'm pretty sure, uh, looking at Dr. Pasma's uh, resume, I mean, you're an expert in Aruba and Curaçao. I'm pretty sure people envy uh, your job, but I certainly would love to go there and do some field studies themselves. Yeah, uh, but uh, uh, jokes aside, it's it's important to have this type of um, resources and the investment that is made not just by NHL Standing University, but all of the partners and all of us benefit, and not just the people in Europe, but you know people around the globe benefit from uh, all of the <laughs> services that the institute provides. So you know keynotes and training, uh, seminars. You know it's a wonderful uh, resource to have, and I'm, I'm very uh, very thankful that. Uh, you guys could uh, take the time uh, to be here uh, with me and, and the show today. Uh, so I wanted to continue uh, uh, with uh, two of uh, uh, your projects and I was kind of intrigued by them. Could you please say a few words about your Notting Hill project? Yeah, the Notting Hill Carnival project. Uh, so that, that took place in, in, in London, of course. It was basically uh, our first uh, big international project. Uh, and uh, via our network, we were invited to, to, to manage this process. And it was really challenging because uh, it was uh, just before the anniversary of the Notting Hill Carnival. Uh, the National Trust uh, uh, threatened the carnival to withdraw their money, their subsidies. 
so the, unless they would have a vision for the future in which yeah, the, the issue of racial, racial issues and youth crime and so on and crowding in the narrow streets of Notting Hill would be, uh, would be settled. So we were called to help them out and to, to, to create a vision. So we did, uh, I went there for a week and we did uh, three scenario sessions, one with uh, the carnivalists, as they call it, so the carnival community. So the, the, the drummers and, and, uh, and the costume makers and so the regular people from, from the community. We did a workshop with uh, visitors. They came back from all over Europe to do a workshop uh, with us. And we also did uh, a workshop with experts like urban planners and urban police and so on. And all these the results were integrated to come up with a set of scenarios that we used to, to profile uh, how the scenario, how the, the carnival could look like in the future. One of the things that is worth mentioning is that uh, for me, of course, as an outsider, I'm also white, so that was for me quite exciting to do this in, in, in this community, such a project. So it was also officially uh, uh, monitored and, and evaluated by an institution. And uh, I started off with, uh, yeah, uh, some applications from appreciative inquiry. And that means that I first started off with sharing the things people were really proud of, of the carnival. And I did not realize yet, just in retrospect, that, that this really helped to, to get an, uh, an even ground where everybody was willing and respectful to each other to share their experiences and their thoughts. So I think that, I think that really helped to make the project a success. Well, uh, I actually going to make a comment because uh, both of you mentioned a few things in there. So, you know, Dr. Yeoman talked about, you know, um, building it. So co-constructing the future, right? And then you have the social vision of inclusions, right? It's social constructionism, right? Yeah. So all of us building or co-constructing this future together. And I think this is an important feature for people to realize. And often people don't. I mean, uh, you you don't sit in, in a research institute and you imagine things and you say that's what it's supposed to be done. Rather, you are in the community. You're involved with you know the tourism authorities, with the city authorities, with the state, but the people, the carnivalists, the people who make the cartons. So this is a community project, and those things do take time, right? It, it can't be done overnight, right? It takes time. That's true. Yeah. And I think, but that's the important thing, I think, is engaging the community and, and building the trust and, and creating uh, creating that relationship. There's only, you know, not only one uh, possible future, but um, rather many. Uh, so I think it really helps that we have uh, that we have experience as educators, as teachers, professors in the university, where we also do this kind of process with our students. And these competences help us, I think, to facilitate these processes also in, uh, in projects. The educator and both of you, and, and that's the uh, the ability of it. So I wanted to stay in you know, along the same lines. Let's go back to the pandemic and its consequences. Could you please say a few words about the post COVID nineteen scenario study you conducted? Yeah, that's also an interesting project because as a futures institute, we more or less felt the responsibility that once the, the COVID pandemic broke out, that we that we really needed to do something with it. Everybody was calling for a perspective, and the entire industry. Uh, the entire industry was panicking, so uh, I, I felt that there's our responsibility to, to, to do a scenario study ourselves to, to uh, try to give the industry some perspective again. So we, uh, we collaborated with two other universities of applied sciences in the Netherlands under the umbrella of CELT, and CELT is the Center of Expertise in Leisure, Tourism and Hospitality. It's important to mention too, because they paid for it, basically. And we, we did with a group of uh, about 15 researchers, we did the entire process and we constructed uh, four scenarios for the, for the visitor economy uh, worldwide uh, post pandemic. And uh, of course it was a time that traveling was, was difficult. Uh, so people found out uh, that we had done this study and we got a lot of invitations to present it during webinars all across the globe. Of course, also in the Netherlands for several industrial platforms, but also Ian did it in Brazil. Uh, we did it in, in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, my colleague Jasper Hesslicha did it in Indonesia. 
We have done it in, in South Africa via the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, in uh, developing countries too. And everybody wanted to hear our story. Uh, and we're still using it because every now and then, uh, or continually, we are monitoring in the news and in, 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 in articles and in, in other uh, press releases and so on in science, uh, what the indications of change are. And uh, I still see clear indications of all four scenarios. So for me, it's still not sure what the future of, uh, of tourism will be. So speaking in uh, Professor Yeoman's words, it's, it's multiple futures. So we said one scenario is going back to usual, business as usual. One scenario was a survival of the fittest. That means that uh, tourism gets scarce and there's a fight between businesses for the tourists. So tourists becomes more expensive and all, only for the happy few. Then we have a scenario business as unusual. That means that yeah, tourism really reinvents itself uh, with virtual reality, AI, and eh, such kind of things. And the, uh, the fourth scenario was all about responsible tourism. So each of the scenarios has uh, specific uh, features, a specific uh, target group, specific actions to be taken by the industry to anticipate this future and together they create a, a platform or, or a, a scope of, of what the industry could do to, to anticipate the future we're heading to. I think you mentioned some <laughs> other part here, which is the issue of monitoring, right? So uh, folks, we don't, uh, when we engage, you know, the universities and the specialists and they help you think or, or imagine those potential futures, you just, just don't put it in a shelf somewhere and forget about it and come back to it next year. So there's monitoring. Right. We're monitoring, you know, looking for weak signals or emerging exactly. trends. And so we're trying to understand, you know, which one, you know, is materializing, which one is not. And also you're on a highway and you're thinking uh, you're going west and then you see a sign that says Warsaw, you know, 50 kilometers. You're going east. You're not going west. <laughs> so uh, it, it's important for people to understand that the engagement with, with scenario planners and the ETFI or NHL, or, or the professionals who work in scenario planning, that's a long-term engagement, right? We're monitoring, yeah. we divide, you know, how we monitor and, you know, so continuous engagement, continuous monitoring. And so it's a process and people sometimes think, oh, you do this, you're done. Thank you very much. Goodbye. No, no, that's, that's not like that. Uh, so we have uh, several questions for you regarding, uh, regarding scenario planning have a long one, but in the work you do uh, within and outside of the tourism industry. Hello, Deb, thank you for your question. So do you see companies incorporating scenario planning methodologies into their business continuity plans? So let's talk a little bit about business continuity. I would imagine larger companies do so, but practically speaking, how can small and medium business sized firms enhance their business continuity plans utilizing this kind of scenario planning to help them minimize risk? Uh, that's an interesting question, and uh, that's also a question that puzzles me uh, very often because I, I, th I think many clients see it as a one-time uh, event, and scenario playing is nice, as, especially if you're in, in, a, in, a, yeah, in a phase where a new policy needs to be made. And you sometimes wonder what, what do they really do with the results later on. So uh, now that I'm professor uh, in this domain for a yeah, more more than 10 years already, uh, I restructured my research group uh, and I want to go to study more into the, the conditions that are needed to make scenario planning strategic foresight and success. And uh, so uh, we appointed the researchers going to, uh, to look in, in small and medium sized enterprises. Uh, another one is going to see, uh, is, is investigating at the regional level and another researcher is, is looking into organizations. And I really want to find out how, uh, which conditions uh, need to be in place in order to make it a success. And that might mean that the language even should be changed in order to make it uh, understandable to them. Because I agree, a small and medium sized enterprises uh, yeah, often uh, live by the day. I don't want to mean it negatively, but they, they have uh, urgent matters every day that need to be solved. And, and, and thinking about long-term futures is, is a challenge for them. So, but it's our task, I think, our duty as a University of Applied Sciences to help them out and really to, to become more resilient and robust or future-proof, if you want, uh, and, and being able to, to deal with uh, yeah, sudden and unexpected events. 
Actually, I wanted to get a more perspective on this one. So um, I tend to explain to people, well, large companies can afford to make mistakes, actually can afford to make many mistakes, but a small and medium business cannot afford that. And therefore, any kind of investment into foresight and understanding, you know, or at least putting some kind of, uh, you know, risk strategies along and, and some tools like scenario planning, foresight methodologies, you know, future wheels, will help them ensure their long-term survivor will it not so i think you know large large companies have the budget to make mistakes smaller yeah. companies don't do so so what's your perspective so should shouldn't we invite those small and medium-sized businesses to engage people like you and other others right universities and institutes to to pursue scenario planning I think so. Yeah, I, I always say also in presentations in, 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 and also in my classes that uh, the bigger uh, capital intensive companies have to, have the power to, to play with money, easily said. So they can they can uh, implement betting strategies, as we call it. So a strategy for each different scenario and, and then quickly upscale or downscale the investments in such a scenario if the, the, the market circumstances change and based on the monitoring that, that they do. But with, uh, with public money or small enterprises, we always uh, proclaim that it's better to look for robust strategy. So that means that we look for strategies or actions that take all scenarios into account. So you have to be prepared for anything that could happen. And, and if we use a scenario across all four scenarios, could, should be a source of inspiration to come up with proper actions and strategies. Wonderful. So, so hello, uh, this is Riot from Turkey. So he's talking about portfolio management of signals. So yeah, there are signals, there are weak signals, uh, right? Uh, so he talked about you know uh, portfolio management of all this information. Uh, he highlighted um, you know he made a couple of trips, international trips after COVID, and he realized that those people were a lot more welcoming. So. Did you both see in your scenario analysis this focus on, on, on the customer or refocusing its attention on the customer? Was that one of the things you, you found or not? Ian, could you maybe? Uh, you're on mute, Ian. We can't hear you. Sorry, you still cannot hear you. It's all right. Um, okay. I think in all, of the, in all of the scenario projects we've been involved in, and because it's not about tourism, it's about the tourists, we all, we're always asking the question, how does the tourist behave in this perspective? What are their motivations? Um, what are their behaviors and how do they respond to the scenario set? So um, <coughs> we've, all, we've always considered that because in one of the scenarios we talked about, Albert talked about, it was um, in the, in the post COVID-19 scenario, there was a scenario where we quickly got back to where we were in 2019. And that was based on the, on the variable. Basically, tourists missed travel. They missed going on holiday. They, they hadn't done it for two or three years because of COVID-19. And there's been a strong desire to, to get back to the beach, to, to visit friends and family. And that's been very strong in the present trends that, that we've seen in the in the in the comeback of tourism in this post-COVID world when all of the restrictions have gone. You know, many of the countries of Europe have had a strong rebound in the terms of tourism, uh, in the terms of doing things. So, in, in most of the scenario sets we're involved in, we're asking the question: Who's the tourist? How do they respond? And, and how do they behave in this world? Yeah, that's indeed uh, important. And I think it's, you know, so many uh, learnings from scenario planning, you know, come to be. And we have all in the business world to have to pay attention to that. So let's engage more with the scenario planners and the people who create those studies. So let's continue our conversation. And I would like to talk a little bit about one of your publications, so specifically the Journal of Tourism Futures. It's certainly a leading publication, Tourism Futures. Could you please share a few words about the journal? Well, um, when FD, the, the European Tourism Futures Institute was set up, um, it was basically initially set up to look at t the future of tourism in Friesland. And uh, as a consequence, one of the things we thought about is what's, what's our legacy? 
where do we go? Because we're a university, we're publicly funded, and we have a responsibility to educate students, to lead with industry, and to say what the future is, because a lot of research is looking backward, it's evaluation, what has happened. Whereas future studies is a lot more speculative, a lot more adventurous. But we work in this arena of, of publications and writing, and many of our researchers have doctorates, um, d doing PhDs, and, and want to publish. So we wanted to give something back to the industry, and we wanted to be a leader. So working with Emerald, um, we have an open access journal, which is um, a platinum grade, so there's no fees involved to, to anybody. And basically, all we do here is publish about the medium to long-term future of tourism. We explore different concepts. We do industry papers. We're interested in methodological and theory development. And that's been the, the success of the journal. It's, it's, it's incrementally grown. And it's, you know, you know it's, a, it's, it's a top journal within in tourism at the moment, not just tourism futures. And we've looked at topics that range from the future of tourism in New Zealand, demography, AI, accessible tourism, how politics influ influences policy. And it, all of this is about trying to create knowledge so we can advance foresight future studies within our, within our industry. And that's been very important for us, both for researchers, teachers, and, and students that are out there. So that's what it's all about. Um, and it's now been going... Oh, nine years, 2014, 2015 was the first issue. Um, and it's just basically gone from strength to strength. Myself, Albert, and our colleague, Dr. Stefan Hartman are the, are the co-editors of the journal. And um, the, it's, the journal's been supported by our university. We've got a great publisher in the terms of Emerald. So it's good to have an outlet for your, for your research and also your, um, also your the global research on tourism futures, but the institute, um, the institute that's been around since twenty four, uh, since twenty ten now, has been right at the centre of knowledge development. It's been right at the centre of the practice of foresight, uh, and and the journal of tourism futures has been where we've published materials. Um, both viewpoint papers and research papers that have that just helps the field move forward yeah so i just wanted to make a, a parenthesis here for people who are watching us the people in the audience uh, so i'm an economist there is no free lunch so the journal is open access because the institutions uh, behind it are paying for this so they are not just uh, uh saying you know we are all for for tourism they're actually, you know, putting their backbone behind it and they created yeah. this platform through, you know, the academics here present and, and the entire team uh, and to not just do the research, but welcome <coughs> other researchers and share this. So not everything is free. Of course, this is free because they are paying for this, but this is yeah. a wonderful resource. It's available free of cost to you who is accessing but not free for them so please uh, when you are uh, visiting the journal don't forget uh, to read the articles to comment to post repost uh you know citations are important uh, don't forget you know uh, they are giving this as a gift to help you advance your research your knowledge etc it's important for all of us uh, to continue to you know recommend talk about sites the journal the articles and the people who are contributing uh, to your success so I wanted to uh, remain in the uh, this issue of publications, right? So uh, we talk a little bit about the Journal of Tourism Futures, but I would like to talk about your other publications. So specifically, I want to go over the Future of Tourism book series. So uh, folks, this is not a book, but rather a series of books. So Dr. Gilman, you're also the editor for the Future of Tourism book series. Can you share your thoughts on the series? Yeah. Um... Sometimes when you're looking at a topic, it's more than one single article. So we also, I'm also involved in a, in a book series where we delve into different topics 
in a lot more depth um, because it's all a part of this process of Im improving knowledge and, and access to knowledge. So I've been working with Professor Una makan at Ulster University you know, for the last 20 years. And I've been publishing with Ch Channel View as a publisher for a long for a long time um and probably around 2014 2015 we talked about let's start a, a series of books about the future of tourism where we can delve into new topics because uh, basically I, I just like to write uh, writing is really important to me um ever since i've been a student i've done a you know bachelor's degree P phd I, I just enjoy writing and, and sharing knowledge and that's what a university professor does um and, and one of the things about being a university professor you have a degree of liberty you can explore the unexplainable you can explore the unknowns and there are so much to the future of tourism in, in doing this so two books that are important in the series that i've that i've done with una one is about science fiction, where science fiction has been about, because to me, a lot of futures work is about plausibility. And it's got to be a future that's plausible. But to me, it's also thinking about a future that's unplausible. It's also about thinking of the unknown. So this delves into the weak signals. This thinks delves into basic science fiction films and what can what can science fiction films tell us about the future these the little acorns of where the future is going and that's all about imagination in the terms of that, that book that we published in in, in 2021 and, and to me i write because i'm passionate about the future i'm quite happy with star wars close encounters of the th third kind et um soiling green um i robot I'm, I'm happy in that world because i see that i see science fiction films as something about the future and science fiction films tell a story about what could happen and how it could happen um bec so because science fiction's got to be based is based upon science and futurism a lot of technology so it's just something i enjoy doing so that was one book I was involved in. And another book I wrote a couple of years just before that was The Future Past. And again, it's looking at the history of tourism because The Future Past of Tourism basically said the future of tourism is similar to what's happened 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And that's really important because if you ask tourists why they've gone on holiday, they've always gone on holiday for enjoyment connecting with family and relaxation and that'll still be the reasons in another 50 and 100 years time so the purpose of the books is to explore single issues or topics but in greater detail which you don't get with a single article um, and i just enjoy and i just enjoy it of course this is fun but the combination of several different perspectives on this theme i think that's that's powerful because again folks this is not about one view or one single future. It's it's a plethora of um, different futures. And we have uh, several questions uh, for both of you. And I think, you know, Professor Pasma, you actually are an expert in dealing with local communities. So Alfonso Vargas Sanchez, thank you for your question. So assuming that future is co-created, what do you think the role of local communities should be in the process of future creation and beyond the usual collaboration between governments and businesses okay in the projects we do we almost always involve the local community so we, we call it the triple or the quadruple helix so we always try to have representatives on all these uh, yeah, people that are responsible for the environment or the city or, or the region or the destination whatever it is uh, and we give them a platform so uh, sometimes people don't know each other Sometimes they do from their own networks, but uh, oftentimes it, it, it's, it's also a platform for exchanging ideas and to, to have chats. So you, you also need to give a room and time for people to, to get acknowledged with each other. Uh, and yeah, I think that's the interesting thing. So, so communities are involved and are really important in co-creating their future. 
especially if it comes to sustainability, of course, where the role I, of the I, local I, is key. Yeah, so that's the other part of your work in terms of sustainability and, and local communities. Actually, I saw, and I'll get to that question, uh, but I saw that uh, you specialize in working with you know, understanding you know, tourism and how it affects or the urban environments. So, and I and both of you being in the Netherlands, I can't help but think about Amsterdam, right? Such huge influx of people into um, such a small concentrated space that is, you know, perhaps not very sustainable. Now we have done a, a project a couple of years ago. It was not really related to scenario planning, but to my PhD study in, on, on over tourism. Right? You already referred to Aruba and Curacao. Uh, so we did not really do scenario planning. We did not involve the local community. That was done in in, in steps later on by the by the by the, the the city councils themselves. But we have been involved with the DMOs, the destination management organizations. So the, the, the management organizations that are leading these destinations towards the future. Uh, nice to say was that we did our workshop on Schiphol Airport, for example. So people came flying from the, the capitals of Europe to, to Schiphol Airport to do a workshop with us in, in, uh, in, in the hotel uh, accommodations available at the airport. And at the end of the day, they flew back. <laughs> so we did not involve local communities at that time, but uh, the representatives of the community. So different kind of questions. So are, uh, are there any recent studies revealing guest expectations that you're aware of? So what would be the priorities of you know, tourism 10 years from now, let's say? Oh, you are mute, we can hear you. We actually republished a paper um, in the Journal of Tourism Futures earlier this year, <coughs> based upon the work of Paul Flatters at the trajectory group in London and basically we asked the question uh, in different in different scenarios which trends slow down which trends accelerate which trends um, completely stop and, and which trends um, go into hibernation and the, uh, and that study and that matrix approach that we did is a, is a good representation of how trends change in different environments and different scenarios. And the, the paper we published looked at um, how the domestic tourist in New Zealand changed because of COVID-19. And that's a good, a good example of the, the situ our present situation, but the model that we used um, can be applied within any context, and it's a good framework as a starting point at a, at a very simple level to understand tourist behaviors and motivations in different scenarios. Wonderful. Well, um, folks, we, you know, this is the WFSF, so we have to dive a little bit into the the meat of the matter. So I'd like to, you know, turn, you know, to Dr. Posma here. And could you please say a few words about the specifically the ETFI scenario model? Yeah, of course, there is a bunch of literature about uh, scenario planning, uh, both from the United States and, and, and from Europe. The approaches are sometimes a little bit different from each other, but uh, you know, we developed our own. Uh, we did not really develop our own approach, but we tweaked it in such a way that it really suits the work we do. And, and it suits also the way we think about the knowledge development and knowledge creation. So it's a cyclic process, and, and like I mentioned before, it, it, we try to gather people around the table beforehand uh, from the community, from the industry, from also including residents. It could be sometimes very big groups. For one project in our province, we did four sessions with about 65 people, uh, including uh, just representatives from the from the community, for example, with, with carpenters even, or, or milkmen or something like that. But uh, what we then try to do with them is try together to understand the system they are part of, without always using the word system, of course. But what we try to do is, is make them aware of the complexity of the world around them and how it impacts upon their destination, their lives, their, their business. And then uh, we call that horizon scanning. So we, 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 we collect a lot of data from the perspective and the knowledge and expertise of those people. We inject it also with our knowledge, and, and this will all be analyzed during these workshops. Uh, 
by means of a facilitated process. We, we try to find patterns in these data and try to find, try to identify together the, the drivers of change and especially the, the drivers of change that are really uncertain concerning its outcomes. And these uncertainties, these key uncertainties are used to, uh, to, sh to form as a framework to, to shape the scenarios. And the drivers of change that are not really critical or uncertain are used within the scenario uh, narratives themselves. So every, all the data are basically used to create four scenarios. The scenario writing itself is done by us as, as a small team, but all the ingredients and also the use of the scenarios afterwards is done with, with all these representatives that I mentioned before. Wonderful. Well, I couldn't like to go without asking you both a question. I hear the journal is working on its 10th year anniversary edition. So could you give us a sneak peek and what's next for the journal and for ETFI? Um, well, there'll probably be a special issue next year. Um, and that'll, that'll be a celebration of some of the work that we've achieved to date. But it'll also be a reflective piece, a, a re reflective piece with industry writers of what their visions are, um, what their op what innovation they see coming, but also what speculations and, and things they want to avoid going forward for the tourism industry. So I think the, the special issue will be very industry focused with some key writers on what are their thoughts about the about the about the future of tour, tourism so um how do they see the next 10 years going forward wonderful you know folks uh, before you go i'd like uh, to invite you to go visit the etfi let me actually go um, there one more time uh, because i i think it's it's important and when you visit the page uh, and you go from home you're going to find the experts so you're going to find our guest here today, you know, Professor Posma, uh, here. And the reason why I realized uh, what he was working on is, you know, because of, you know, managing visitor pressure in an urban setting, it's uh, up and coming. So new research. Uh, so if you want to find out what's in store, what are they working on? You know, you can also visit, you know, Professor Yeoman's uh, page here. Uh, says a little bit about you know what he's doing and i was really intrigued about your uh, future of polar tourism so i hope uh, both of you can come back to talk about you know the you know how tourism you know puts pressure on cities on on such uh, concentrated uh, urban areas and then of course the future of uh, you know polar tourism is should be in mind uh folks uh before we um uh, we part our ways. I wanted to uh, also invite you to go take a look at the World Future Studies Federation. Uh, we are, you know, planning. Uh, of course, the moment I switch to the page, it changes. But we're planning the 50th anniversary. The conference is going to take place in Paris uh, this upcoming October. And of course, uh, if you want to hear or learn more about, you know, what? Oh, there we are. The 50th anniversary celebration, 25th and 26th of October in Paris, France. And if you want to find uh, our stuff, you just go to the World Future Studies Federation under communications. And then you're going to find our page in there. That's your truly Futures Television, Radio Future. So this interview with, you know, Dr. Yeoman and Dr. Posma is going to be broadcast via radio, then via television. And of course, all of the archives, all of the prior shows, WFSF members, uh, can be found here and um, in the WFSF page itself. So, folks, I want to start saying my my thank you. So, you know, stay tuned. The show in focus is broadcast via Future Television, the home of the future on television on Roku TV. It's available freely via the Roku stick or the Roku enabled TV sets. You can also find Future Television on Apple TV, and of course, you can see our archive in WFSF dot org uh, so please add futures television to your list of um, preferred channels uh, dr posma dr yoma thank you so very much for taking you know time of your busy schedules of course it's the evening in europe i'm talking from the pacific time zone they are in central european central time so it's the evening thank you so much for taking uh, some of uh, your evening to be here 
with me, the WFSF gang, and all of the folks. So thank you so much. Uh, and folks, uh, I want to say again, uh, thank you so much for being here with us. I hope you go visit, you know, uh, Professor Yeomans and Professor Bosma's pages, visit the ETFI, uh, the Journal of Tourism, and of course, the WFSF. Uh, thank you so very much for being here with us. I'm going to leave you with our institutional message. <laughs>